Yo from the Kingdom of Ohio. You are listening to Old Culture, where we definitely hear Laurel, and we definitely smell some high MK Ultra style fuckery along with it. Welcome to the D program. I am your host Ryan Peverly, the man with no plan whatsoever. I'm just trying to live, trying to survive in these most Gnostic of times. And who better to do that with than our guest here today, Mr. Miguel Connor. Miguel is the host of Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio, which he calls a cult show dealing with the forbidden wisdom of the Gnostics that is more relevant than ever in a fracturing world. It is one of my absolute favorite podcasts, and if you haven't heard it yet, well, you're probably too busy feeding other demiurges. Miguel also describes himself as a garage philosopher and hedge historian, and he's also a professional storyteller, which is evident in his podcast, and also because he's written a few books. The critically acclaimed Voices of Gnosticism and Other Voices of Gnosticism, as well as some fiction, the post-apocalyptic vampire epic series The Dark Instinct Trilogy, as well as a fantasy novel The Executioner's Daughter, His writing has also appeared in such publications as The Gnostic Journal and Reality Sandwich, among others. But Miguel and I aren't even going to talk about Gnosticism. I'm just kidding, we are. This entire conversation is about Gnosticism. So let's cast this pot off deep into the Pleroma, where those goddamn Archons can't lay one slimy tentacle on you, and where love always lights the way. Enjoy. Miguel Connor, thanks for being here, man. Ah, thanks for having me on. It's uh, great to be here, and uh, how are things in the holy land of Ohio? By the way, yes, I don't want to take over because I'm used to asking the questions, but (laughs) I've always called it the holy land of Ohio since my teens. Is this like a normal term or something that you made up? Well, I call it the kingdom of Ohio, and it obviously has a similarity in the, the use of language there. I don't know where it comes from. I know that there was a novel not long ago that was put out called The Kingdom of Ohio. And I don't Uh, know where the guy who wrote that got that phrase from. So that stuck. I haven't read it. I actually have a copy of it. I just haven't. I haven't read it. You know. Yeah, there's something archaic and uh, mystical about Ohio, even though I've only been to uh, Cincinnati. But uh, I don't know. I guess it's kind of funny. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah. And okay, so just uh, real quick, I'll tell you where it came from. So I listened to Coast to Coast growing up in the 90s. And Art Bell had this <laughs> phrase that he used called the kingdom of nigh, N-Y-E. It would be like one of those bumper teasers going into commercial. He would like he would come back from a break and he would say, or he had like a voiceover that would said from the kingdom of nigh, it's Coast to Coast AM <laughs> with Art Bell. So I thought, wow, the kingdom of Ohio. I, I was thinking of that there novel. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, that's a pretty cool thing. And I think of Ohio as like a, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but I think of it as like three words, O, high, O, and like referring to the <laughs> to the most high, like you're kind of talking to yes. the most high or something. <laughs> So, yeah, it's a very royal and majestic sort of yes, language yes. choice. But anyways, <laughs> yeah, so before we uh, smear some gnosis all over the eardrums of the fine folks out there, let's briefly revisit a chat we were both part of not too long ago. You were kind enough to join me for a conversation with Eric Davis uh, and Jeff Wolf recently. I very much appreciated your presence there. It was a great chat. Seemed to ruffle a few feathers on the old Twitter for reasons we won't get into, but regardless... Mm, I'd love to get into the reasons. Well, (laughs) okay, let's do it. Go ahead. What did you think of some of the feedback we got? Well, first of all, it was was a really great conversation. Uh, Like you, I've been a big fan of Eric for a long time. I think he's one of the preeminent cultural philosophers of our days. Love his work on Philip K. Dick and anything he does. So it was a it was a great roundtable. Everybody brought a lot to the table. But Eric, of course, always was just amazing. So, yeah, again, it was a surprising reaction on Twitter. I mean, most of it was positive and it should have been. But I guess one individual was wondering and we we made a joke about it. It was kind of tongue in cheek with us about how four dudes were talking about Babylon and Sophia Mm -hmm. and the divine feminine. But I agree with uh, Eric that all of us were talking from a historical perspective. So it was that was fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. And I certainly agree with Eric's answer that Babylon is for everybody. So is Sophia. 
I think I know it's sort of uh, anti-PC today, but the truth is I agree with Jung that all people are born with an anima and an animus. And if anything, men need to get closer to their anima. In fact, when I did, somebody did a tarot reading recently, I never do my own tarot because I just don't have any patience. But uh, she said I needed to work more on getting closer to my anima. And I was kind of surprised because uh, obviously I'm a big fanboy of Sophia and the divine feminine and other goddesses. But it just told me I need to embrace this harder. So I really didn't see anything wrong with with talking about it, especially we were talking about it theological, we were talking about the perspective of other occultists and how they discovered it. So I was fine with that. But again, this is the world we live in. And uh, unfortunately, it's a world where you have to, you can't leave your own little borders, you have to self define yourself. And that, of course, goes completely against what the ancient Gnostics were. I mean, yes, you are supposed to transcend your gender. But at the end of the day, you're also not supposed to identify. You're, stupo- you're supposed to go into something greater. So from my perspective, that was uh, a little surprising. We're not surprising. What am I saying? Well, <laughs> it was almost too predictable. It's the first episode that I put out there that it had such a uh, a defined negative backlash to it. Like you said, it was mostly positive, but there was that, that little hiccup there. Where you know, To the same point, though, I am curious about something. You know, I always wonder how fellow podcasters absorb the conversations that they're part of and, and you know how they affect a particular mode of thought within them afterwards. And maybe you've already answered this, but was there anything that came out of that chat that stuck with you? Yeah, a lot of it did. And I should backtrack too. Again, I don't know why I'm surprised. Maybe because it was Twitter, maybe because I thought it was so awesome. But in my YouTube section comments, I get the most amazing polemics against me. It's almost like I can't win. If I do a show on this, I'm a, a raging socialist. If I do a show on that, I'm a Nazi. If I'm this, I'm against the goddess. I'm against. So it's not that surprising. But what I got from the show is, uh, well, I thought, uh, obviously, love the Parson stuff, love the Babylon stuff, and how we went back and forth on the, the goddess and Crowley and all that. It was very enlightening. But towards the end, uh, Eric was uh, fascinating about how he talked when I asked him about what a Technosis 2.0 would look like. And that was the, the thing that was almost, uh, I don't know if disheartening, but it was hard, or at least that's what I heard in his voice, because when he wrote Technosis and Nomad Codes, I loved his idea is about the Bardo, those secret spaces where the counterculture could go and all of us could relate that place where we could talk comic books and smoke pot those places those little secret esoteric churches or rituals those places where surfers went to where the guys on the margins of the town could go and find not a solace but also find the great mysteries of life again those on the edge of town and uh, as he said and i've agreed and others have spoken about it seems like the digital aid has destroyed those bardos those in those in between spaces those secret spaces where the geek and the mystic could hang out to and now it's been thrown it's been thrown all out i mean it wasn't i mean i remember when the internet came out it was interesting because hey you no longer had to worry about the what the freemasons did because you could find all the rituals right on the internet in the early 2000s and uh, all this stuff went to the forefront and at the time it was real it was really cool nothing is secret we've got all this gnosis we can dig into but all of a sudden you wonder well now this is all out in the open where do we go for our secrets where do we go to the shadows where we go to the forbidden is it anywhere and the worst of all is this stuff, as we've all seen, can be weaponized. It can be corrupted. It can be used against you. Again, there is no, the shadow side is out, but there's no place to go hide in the shadows for some sanctuary, for some unholiness or for some darkness or just to hang out with like-minded people. Those days are over. So we wonder what what, what are things going to look like in the future? What do we do? Where can we go? Is it in the material world or does it matter? Because with Snapchat and our videos on our phones, again, nothing is secret, nothing is hidden, everything's out. And uh, this all can be corrupted, and it's, in a way, it's taken a, a lot of the magic out of it. Yeah, it does seem like, uh, we'll use some Gnostic terms here, it does seem like the uh, the Archonic controllers have sort of flushed everything into the visible spectrum and then sort of, I don't want to say completely destroyed, because maybe there is some hope out there, but they, they definitely have destroyed some of the places where those counterculture ideas and principles could thrive. 
And like, yeah, I was kind of disheartened by that same thing. So I'm glad you pointed that out. But you know, all in all, yeah, and it, it makes uh, it makes perfect sense because as the internet brought all this information, it seems that the powers that be or the powers are, uh, powers and principalities would react to is to flood us with this information, dilute it, and even corrupt it. So uh, I think we're all in agreement that this is sort of a, a tenuous place to be. And we wonder, well, where do we go? Not all of us are natural born digital surfers where we're fine just in chat rooms and forums and all that. There has to be an experience of the physical, more than an experience, but an actual sort of lifestyle and escape to it. So uh, yeah, interesting times. We'll see where this goes. We'll see, and we'll see if somebody has an answer to this. Definitely, man. Man, definitely. So let's rattle some eardrums now. I know this is old hat for some people who've heard your show or heard you on on other shows and, you know, for yourself too, probably. But I am a storyteller, as are you. And this is the first time I've been able to have someone on to tell this part of this story in this space, you know. So if you had to write a, a, a treatment for a film based on this rather provocative pocket of renegade Christians, how would you describe the Gnostics in their cosmology, if you had to summarize it in like one page. One page. Well, I guess we might just start from the beginning, how this sort of the first time in history got this Gnostic vibe. It might be something like Plato's cave. I think Plato's cave itself is very Gnostic. I mean, what's the the allegory of the cave? We are stuck in a cave in this sort of uh, darkness. All we see is shadows, and we assume that these shadows are the truth. And how are these shadows created it? Well, they're created by these people. I guess they are archons who have fires behind us and are creating these shadows and making us think this is real, but this is not us. And you hope that one person will escape and go out into the light and see reality for what it is, see the real beauty of reality. So that, I think, was the first inspiration for the Gnostics, and that story has been told and retold and inspired. It certainly inspired the Gnostics and their mythology, and even today has inspired many. I mean, what is Plato's cave these days? I guess the best uh, allegory or analogy would be the Matrix. That is the uh, Matrix. Neo was in the he was in the cave, and he had to escape by taking the red pill and see reality for what it is. So I would say, well, let's start with those who knew before, and that would be Plato, and that would tell people, well, each of us has to write their own story. I've written a novel called Stargazer, which is very Gnostic, and I've certainly done this work on the show for many years and try to show the different uh, ways that Gnosticism has appeared in culture. Is there a specific point in history that, that we can point to and say that this is when Gnosticism emerged as, you know, as a belief system? It is hard. I think it's always it's safe and even sensible to say first century Christianity. That's when Gnosticism really formed or became uh, coded, if you would. That's where can you say here it is. But uh, the vibe has always been there. I mean, again, I mentioned Plato's cave. But even before that, you've got... Uh, the book of Daniel and the book of Enoch, where suddenly people are starting to have revelations that this universe may not be controlled by the supreme divinity or whatever the high God you feel, but they're being managed by angels, even fallen angels. They're the ones who are causing the trouble. You've got the cult of Orpheus talking about how what we are is Dionysus. What's the story? The myth of Dionysus and the cult of Orpheus is where Dionysus is there as a child and the Titans show up out of nowhere and they eat him up and then Zeus shows up and he destroys them with a lightning bolt. But the essence of the Titans, which represents the earth and the essence of Dionysus, which is pure divinity, gets mixed in. So suddenly we have the divine sparks lost in the world. And according to those of the cult of Orpheus, we have to do all these rituals to get the essence of Dionysus back to Olympus, back to wholeness. And this vibe is appears. It appears with the, the Hermetics in, uh, in Egypt who are taking some of the, the Egyptian mysticism and distilling it. So the Gnostic vibe seems to appear in different places, in different, uh, you know, including Paul. But again, it really doesn't get streamlined and you might say perfected and all that into the first and second century. And by then it was just, uh, it was like a, a lead balloon when it came to the Christian and uh, pagan authorities in the world and has remained very controversial throughout history. Yeah, I've seen some people call the Gnostics the original conspiracy theorists. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that's a pretty apt description of them. But why would they be called that? 
you have to understand that how people saw the world back then and even today. I mean, you lived in a world where the gods ruled. You either did what the gods did and you appeased them through sacrifice. You either made covenants with the gods. You even uh, commune with the gods like some of the shamans did. And what the gods did is they spread their holiness down onto this world which they managed, which was, for the most part, a good world. And it was the world that humans lived in. And that's how the universe and the, the grace of the gods even spread to the governments, to the priests, to the king. I mean, everything was basically... Uh, finely tuned machine and this is something we're talking probably since what tens of thousands of years since uh paleo paleolithic man was doing and then suddenly out of nowhere you come with these fellows who uh, like you said these conspiracy theorists who come out of nowhere and said hold on hold on what if this is all a lie it's and not i'm mean, not even talking an illusion like they might think in india what if this is a complete fabricated construct uh, a rusty machine a prison if you would what have we been lied to what if the gods themselves those who claim to have created us and bless us and give us a crop what if they're not really gods but just sort of haughty demons or they're not as holy as we might think but they're actually pretty insane and uh, again and what if even better what if suddenly oh my god we are better than the gods. We humans have something stored within us, this divine spark that calls us to go beyond the material universe, beyond the stars themselves, and go touch upon an ultimate source, a supreme intelligence, something that, again, goes beyond uh, this mechanistic universe. That right there, and even today, was extremely controversial. And uh, it was truly innovative and something that had never happened before. We we're talking about the Gnostic vibe. Again, we can go even further back to the story of Prometheus. What does Prometheus do as sort of the, I say, uh, the first Jesus figure? He goes and he steals fire from the God, which some said is te represents technology, but it could represent our own divine spark or our own uh, realization of something beyond the universe. And he gives it to man. And the tyrannical Zeus decides to imprison prometheus and in some of the myths prometheus is actually sort of the he's the one who created man because he cared for it and uh, it was zeus who imprisoned us on this earth to be his slaves i think in the in some of the sumerian ones i think enki keeps humans as slaves so um needless to say the gnostics were as they were called paranoid because they thought the entire universe every stone every culture every piece of earth was designed in a way to keep us trapped and to have the gods basically in a sort of vampire way feed off of our divine essence very much like in the matrix where they're feeding where the matrix feeds off of our brains our electrical impulses so that uh, didn't go well but that was sort of the the beginning in history where man suddenly stood up you might say to the gods beyond the myths like prometheus but this is where man stood up to the divine order which included the culture the governments the temples and all that so pretty controversial, pretty unique. And it again, this is something that from not just the Christian, Roman Christian, but we're talking governments in uh, Asia. We're talking about uh, Islamic governments. Whenever the Gnostic impulse came out their history, they had to snuff it out because this wasn't a way to control the world or be part of the be part of the providence of the ruling gods. Let me tell you a couple of things about me real quick. So in college, I wrote a short story about a woman and her name was Sophia Valentine. Oh, wow. I did not know what Gnosticism was back then, obviously. I have only, I've only recently discovered Gnosticism, you know, like two or three years ago. So, yes, I mean, that's, uh, I think, uh, <laughs> sorry for the interruption, but no, yes, the, the, the Aeon Bite, the title of the show, I used to call it Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis, but Aeon Bite was a character that also came to me sort of in a dream, and I wrote a short story about her. So uh, it was wow. interesting how these things are bubbling down in the collective unconscious, and if we all look, we see it coming up, and we see it as part of our history before we actually realize or admit we've taken the red pill in our older days definitely yeah so give us a brief overview of the sophia character in gnosticism sophia or the divine feminine because it really the change i mean one thing the gnostics were doing was sort of writing uh, you might say fan fiction it was a form of internal therapy or different variations of the vision that their communities got but one of their central myths is that of sophia which is uh 
in the Gnostic cosmology, you start out with the oneness, but this oneness suddenly becomes conscious or tries to understand itself. And as soon as it understands itself before, as soon as it goes an I and a thou, a, uh, a principle splits out and this principle is feminine. And often they call it Barbello. And in our little uh, foursome we had, Barbello, some think that, well, Barbello has a relation to Babylon. But with this uh, source in, Bar in Barbello, there becomes a communication. And each time they communicate, which is trying to find characteristics of what this oneness is, it creates a new form, which they call the aeons, which are personhoods of certain characteristics, like personhood of uh, justice, personhood of uh, pure intelligence, personhood of kindness and these aeons sort of spread out again in a very emanation emanation uh, theology and as they spread out one of the last aeons that is created that spreads out from the mind of god the oneness of god who's having an interaction with barbello the divine feminine her name is sophia and she is obviously wisdom now in a lot of the gnostic texts wisdom decides to rebel and some don't give a reason. Some say because she needed to know the center. She wanted to go atop across these other aeons and find out what's going on, which makes sense because wisdom being wisdom, wisdom always needs to find out what's going on. That was her nature. In others, she tries to create something be without the permission of the other aeons or the, the ultimate God. But for whatever reason... Sophia gets expelled from the pleroma, which, uh, which is Greek for fullness, which means the, the fullness of the divine, the, the eternal kingdom of the Gnostics. And she gets tossed down into the chaos. And some, she basically splits off. There's a higher and lower Sophia. She gets thrown down into the chaos. If you hadn't noticed, this is very much sort of a Luciferian myth, which happened long before Satan got, have, you know, got his real story. This happened, uh, again, in the first century or before. So Sophia falls from the Pleroma, and she goes through her own passion. She becomes, she is filled with all these negative emotions, fear, dread, loneliness, all that. And these emotions begin to create the material world, which is what happens, as, again, as she's having her little crisis. She also becomes pregnant with her own sorrow and, the, and eventually has an abortion. And this abortion comes out and takes the shape of a lion-headed dragon. And this dragon she calls Yaldabaoth. And we don't know the, the, what, the, what Yaldabaoth means. Some, think it might, some scholars believe it just might mean a child of chaos. But Yaldabaoth suddenly takes over and takes part of her power, her divine essence, and he decides he's going to shape the universe in his own in his own desire because he looks up at the the pleroma, the realm of the true God or the, the true mind, and he decides he's going to create his own copy, his own kingdom. And basically, whoa, lo and behold, he, he creates our material universe and he creates all and he gives, brings forth with him these other rulers, which again, he takes, which are copies of the aeons. And these are called the archons. These are the planets, the rulers of hell, a lot of the gods, uh, hundreds, thousands of them. And each one of them has a job to manage the universe. This is the mess we've in because basically part of Sophia's essence has been used to build the universe. So it is up to Sophia, who in some of the myths decides she needs to call help from the Aeons. So she is helped by the Aeon Christ and so forth. Another, she basically goes to war with uh, Yaldabaoth to try to get her energy back and get the universe to collapse and get everything back into harmony. And this is where we also enter the, the book of Genesis, because in a lot of, uh, in some of the tales, like the secret book of John or on the origins of the the world or so forth, Yaldabaoth decides he's going to create man. He sees an image up there, maybe the image of Christ or something like that, the primal man that you hear, the, or the Adam Cadman of the Kabbalists. So he creates this man, but he's just sort of a worm. He's just not moving around. He's just not there. So Sophia infuses her essence into this man. Again, this is sort of a part of her divine plan to uh, take down her son, her abortion. And uh, this man becomes becomes animate and then uh, Yaldabaoth goes ah but there's something inside of him that's so powerful that's that energy of Sophia so and she removes this energy from the side of Adam and lo and behold we get Eve but Eve is really superior to Adam she is a manifestation of Sophia and uh, she's the one who fully awakens Adam this golem to who really is and what's going on with the universe and of course then the snake also in a lot of the tales helps out 
God. The snake is an incarnation of either Sophia or Jesus or so forth. But here becomes the divine bad or a plan because Yaldabaoth finds out and throws him out of the garden, tries to imprison him, and the whole Old Testament saga goes, which was reinterpreted very differently by the Gnostics. But in essence, that is Sophia, and of course, she wasn't just brought out of just out of the dark. I mean, you have the myth where, uh, again, bringing Prometheus out, where uh, Prometheus, he causes a pain in Zeus, and Zeus splits his own head open, and suddenly comes out Athena, the goddess of wisdom, which has parallels to the Gnostic story of Sophia. But this was part of the plan of Prometheus to hopefully one day get, you know, bring Zeus down a few pegs. And then you have in uh, Jewish literature, like in Proverbs, you have this uh, figure of wisdom that is keeping God company, that is comforting man, that is helping him form the universe in the right way. So a lot of these ancient Jews who would later become Gnostics probably saw that there was a figure of wisdom out there and they decided to adapt her and basically promote her and, and she became part of the Gnostic myth. Yeah, man, this I just love that story. And uh, I'm going to jump around here a little bit because I, I find it hard to actually categorize some of these questions I have. But my first introduction to Gnosticism actually was reading the work of Carl Jung, who I know, mm. you know, you're pretty knowledgeable of his work as well. But we know that he was influenced by the Gnostics, and he's been credited with some writings about, about Gnosticism in the early 1900s, uh, way before the discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library. Right. So where or how were he and others being exposed to these ideas if there weren't a lot of texts available? That's a good question. I mean, we do have the writings of the Church Fathers, and uh, for some reason the Church Fathers were obsessed with the Gnostics. They really thought they were a threat, so they catalog all the different sects and all the different myths. And with the Nag Hammadi Library, we do find there are parallels, and in some places they, they do quote these texts. So Carl Jung would have certainly been privy to, as a knowledgeable man of those times of the 19th century, he should have, he would have been exposed to the, to the heresy hunters and some of the Gnostic myths. And of course, the Gnostics are talked about in esoteric circles, Jewish circles, and other circles throughout history. So, and, and of course, Jung was very much inclined to be looking for esoteric knowledge because, again, that was part of his whole idea. Was uh, He was looking at the ancient myths. He was trying to get his ideas on consciousness and archetypes. And he just, he ran into the Gnostics and he said very, he said it was like, uh, I had finally discovered my long lost friends because these people they understood the soul better than anybody. And they, according to Jung, they understood the nature of evil better than anybody. And uh, to him, he, he called them history's first death psychologist, because in these myths, you if you take them allegorically, it seems that the Gnostics really are talking about the human mind, the depth of the human mind. I mean, Sophia's wisdom, Yaldabaoth is our controlling ego. The aeons are characteristics of the mind and how they work. All these heavens and archons are pieces of psychosis that we have to get through to get better. So to Jung, the Gnostics offer just this amazing view of the human mind, of the human consciousness, and this amazing view of really mystical theology and, uh, again, mythology that he found so uh, not endearing, but also useful for his own work. Definitely, yeah. And we'll come back to Jung in a bit, but so that was my introduction to Gnosticism was through his work. Let's talk about your journey to Gnosticism. And I'd like to start in Portugal. You were born there, right? Yeah, I was born there, but I never really lived there that much. My father traveled around, so we were always on the move. So I don't think there was really anything Gnostic about Portugal. It was just basically back then a very Catholic country, and uh, we moved around, grew up in Mexico and so forth. But I guess as a kid, I was sort of that, again, we're talking about Bardos. I was one of those kids that always needed to be in those uh, sacred dark places. I needed to be with my science fiction novels. I needed to be playing Dungeons and Dragons. I I needed to be reading uh, a lot of things I wasn't supposed to be reading, having thoughts I shouldn't be having, writing a lot, drawing a lot, and so forth. So I was one of those, I guess, mystically inclined misfits and so forth. So it just, it made sense. I don't know, again, when might have been my first hints of Gnosticism, obviously, when I was a kid, I would read the flood story and go, what the hell? 
I can't believe this. I mean, look at this God. Was he doing drowning children for no good reason and so forth? But that was sort of a massage by my mom who used to say, well, these are just ancient people and their myths. And, you know, that's how they thought were tribal gods. And the New Testament is a different Jesus. But it still sort of stuck with me like this guy's angry. I mean, again, going back to Carl Jung is the perfect archetype for the tyrant. And uh, all of us have that tyrant within us. All of us have Yaldabaoth within us. But uh, as I grew up, I really never heard about it until I was like in college. I mean, there were times where, for example, I'd watch a movie like Time Bandits or something like that, or read a science fiction novel like by Michael Moorcock, where I said, well, this is starting to make sense. This idea of multiverse layered rule by different haughty beings and where everything is sort of an illusion and a trap. And it was here and there, The Devil Dinosaur by uh, Jack Kirby was another big one when I was a kid. That was my first exposure to the ancient, uh, ancient astronauts and so forth and it made perfect sense but I always had this sense of yeah this is engineered and somehow I'm trapped because I feel trapped I always feel trapped in my culture I never feel free and I used to be one of those guys that said well if I'd been born in the 60s I'd be happy dude or if I'd been born in medieval times and could carry a sword I'd be happy or if I'd be born in Tolkien's world I'd be happy but there was always a sense that something was off, that I was trapped in this world and there was something even greater than I could ever imagine out there. But it was still, again, this was a, this was a fabricated illusion. This was a trap. So later on, I went to Catholic college and the priest in an Old Testament uh, class, I always thought it was weird because he'd bring up the Gnostics and he'd say, there was these ancient Christian called Gnostics who believed in reincarnation and this and that and stay away from them. It's like something he'd been given marching orders from at the top to bring it up here and there. And then a few months later, he'd go, oh, yeah, there was this ancient sect called the Gnostics, and they believed in reincarnation and direct experience with the divine. Stay away from them. But I didn't put much attention. I was like, well, these guys are pretty cool. But I, I also knew I was in my 20s, so I was just being rebellious. And I was already practicing a lot of different things. But it was only really in my 30s, middle 30s, that I really started getting into uh, Gnosticism by uh, reading Elaine Pagels and so forth. Well, the reason I brought up Portugal is because I wanted to get a sense of, and since you grew up, I guess, more in Mexico then, I think the same question still applies. But right. I wanted to get a sense of, you know, when you move to America, because you, you live in Chicago now, but when you move to America, like, what was the difference between the, the religious or spiritual environment like? Well, I think the difference was the magic realism just sort of died off. And that's something I, I miss from both uh, Mexico and Portugal and other countries like that. Suddenly I was here in the United States and it was just sort of all black and white. There was a, like a lack of imagination, even in Catholic circles. There wasn't that fun sort of... Uh, you see supernatural things or people see supernatural thing and you just accept it's part of the fabric. You, you're walking down a village and somebody says, you know, the devil lives there. Somebody saw the devil the other day with his horns and you sort of accept it. You're not as struck in the, the world of, of reason and logical forms. It's not just ABC. Things are, reality is more elastic and uh, you're more into the folklore religions and the folklore rituals and so forth. And you do get experiences and often you get visions, even as a kid and so forth. So that's what I thought was the big difference. Again, the United States was this just very extroverted, materialistic, control sort of country. And, uh, of course, I loved it here because uh, people were great, uh, the culture was great, pop culture was great, and so forth. But I'd say that's a difference that I missed. Yeah, that's that seems to be a, a common theme amongst people who move here after living for several years, especially like a full, you know, sort of youth somewhere else, you know, they grow up, especially, mm -hmm. you know, I've met a lot of people who grew up in Mexico, and they grew up Catholic, of course, but it's a different form of Catholicism than you get here. Exactly. You know? Yes, yeah. it's more tied in with the indigenous people and so mm -hmm. forth. And the, the Aztec gods and goddesses are sort of woven in and so forth. So it's great. Same with Brazil, because I had family in Brazil and all that. So even in Portugal, you just know some of these saints have to be old gods and they're more really interesting stories about the devil and the magic using saints and people mm -hmm. there. So it's a it's got a, it's got more of a fantasy D&D &D vibe about it that I really miss. 
one thing the Catholic Church knew what to do in its marketing was uh, appropriate as many traditions as it could and use them for their own. So it's like they just took a lot of things and rebranded them. But again, it's hard for here in the United States or even in uh, a lot of Western Europe because it's been uh, so dried out. All the mysticism has been taken out. But yeah, Catholicism can be a very dynamic religion if you you know. But again, it's just been uh, rebranded and covered in different shapes and forms. Sure, sure. Yeah. So you mentioned that your podcast started off called Coffee, Cigarettes and Gnosis. And, you know, I thought for the longest time, it was a reference to a Jim Jarmusch film called Coffee and Cigarettes. And I was going to ask you here if it was, but I got a little antsy and asked you on Facebook instead. Right. And you said, no, it's not a reference to that. And I was kind of disappointed because I'm a fan of uh, Jarmusch's films, which we may touch on a bit later as well. And then you transition that show into the name that we know it as now, Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. I'm curious, though, you know, how has hosting that show changed your perception of yourself? You know, like talking to these these Gnostic scholars and these Gnostic thinkers, like how has that shaped your view of, of you and your perceptions of, of the world that you live in? Well, obviously, it's accentuated my Gnostic leanings and so forth. But at the same time, it's really been humbling and I've been very grateful. I mean, I love having these conversations with these people and they have different ideas. They have conflicting ideas. There's people from different backgrounds. And I always feel like everybody has something important to say. It's very hard to get a book published today. It's very hard to write one. And I feel a lot of people, they need some sort of platform. And that's what we in the alternative media do. We do an important service because uh, it's hard to get any action in the legacy media and a lot of the really dangerous ideas are completely ignored. So I'm very happy to give a lot of these people a platform, especially those who are usually connected with Gnosticism or have their take on some sort of aspect of Gnosticism or have written about it, uh, ancient, modern culture and so forth. So I'm very uh, grateful and privileged to be able to uh, share this information with the audience definitely man i haven't been doing this nearly as long as you have but i i feel the same way it, it, mm-hmm. it's a you feel like you've taken on a great responsibility like once you start to see that people gravitate towards the work that you're putting out there and they they like it and you're like well shit now i now i really <laughs> have to get my ass in gear and keep yeah this you up. gotta keep putting yeah. the content out because sure. uh yeah Time is short. <laughs> Definitely. Hey, so I mentioned I was going to tell you a couple things about myself. I mentioned the Sophia Valentine short story. The other thing I wanted to mention, too, was my middle name is Thomas. It's a family name. It's been passed down. You know, my dad, my dad's dad, and so on and so forth. It's just Thomas throughout all these generations. What does that tell you about me? Well, there's a lot of synchronicity there, and it looks like even better you're you're looking at your synchronicity because even Jung as a therapist, I think he was he had mystic uh, connotations to synchronicity, but for, even from a um, clinical materialist point, synchronicity is when you start noticing these things, it means you're addressing things about your mind and your consciousness you need to address. So if you're seeing Sophia Valentine based on the Gnostic sage Valentinus and Thomas, which of course it's the Gospel of Thomas, where Thomas in Hebrew means a twin, and he also calls himself Didymos Thomas, which is twin twin. And the, jo- the the little play on words is that he is the lower twin of Jesus, because the Gnostics really like to play with this idea of the daemon and the Adalon, the higher and the lower self, which so many traditions play with. And of course, that comes from Socrates and so forth. So that tells me you're, if anything, I, I don't know if you're, you probably are the lower twin of Jesus. I guess we all are, right? We're the lower aspect of the logos here on earth but uh, you are paying attention so that's a good thing well my first name in hebrew means little king or little ruler so Ah. that's an interesting pair ryan thomas yes demiurge and the twin right there (laughs) (laughs) definitely definitely so yeah i do want to talk about some other figures in gnosticism or i guess some figures from christianity and how the gnostics view them and you know is thomas a, a central figure in gnosticism then There is literature based on him, but it's not just Gnostic. I mean, you could make an argument that the Gospel of Thomas is not the sort of uh, central Gnosticism that you had with the Sethians and the Valentinians and the Mythosophia and the Demiurge, which we call also Yaldabaoth and so forth. So, but there is other literature too, the, the Book of Thomas, the Contender and all that. So at some point he was seen as an important figure and he was revered and his name was used as a his name was used 
used uh, in a lot of the literature. I mean, some have said in the canonical Bible, in the Gospel of John, uh, you have Doubting Thomas, who was going to put the, his his hands through the wo- wounds of Jesus, but you never see it happen. That's a weird scene. But some have said, like Elaine Pagels and others, that what happened was this was written to uh, show it was a negative connotation of Thomas to sort of marginalize those who followed him, those those communities, those Gnostic communities that followed him. So that's really what we have of Thomas. Of course, there's a lot of legends of Thomas. He went to India. He went to Syria. You've got the grave of Thomas in both Syria and India. So uh, that's uh, that's pretty much the tradition, but I wouldn't call it Gnosticism proper per se. Mm-hmm. What role does a figure like John the Baptist play? Well, that's a good one. I mean... John the Baptist is mentioned here and there and different aspects in the Nag Hammadi library. In one, he's almost, I think I was reading the other day, paraphrase of Shem. He's almost seen as sort of a demon. He's put in a negative light. In others, he's put in a more positive light. He's, there's really not much in the Nag Hammadi library. But from uh, some of the church fathers or the Christian folklore, he was considered one of the fonts of the alternative religion or the alternative movements away from the cult of Jerusalem. And he was the one who chose Simon Magus to be his successor. And Simon Magus, if your listeners don't know, he was considered uh, beyond how he's portrayed in Acts of the Apostles. He was considered the font of all heresy and the font of all Gnosticism. The church, many of the church fathers decided that he was the first, he was the source of all the bad ideas or all the Gnostic ideas. And he was part of the movement. And, uh, In the legends, uh, uh, you have Simon Magus around the time of Jesus. He is considered the great incarnation of God on earth. And what happened is that we go back to the mind of God, how in this myth, the Simonian myth, God has a first thought, which he calls the Anoya, which means the first thought of God or something like that. And these managing angels, which we've mentioned about how the Judo-Christians saw the universe managed by angels, they kidnapped her for her power. This one, she doesn't give birth to Yaldabaoth, and this one, she is kidnapped by the Archons themselves and kept into this world so that she can basically fuel the world and the... Uh the real God can't really have all his faculties. So the real God or the real the mind of God incarnates as Simon Magus, Simon the Magician. And he goes around looking for her, but she keeps reincarnating throughout history. She was once Helen of Troy. And eventually she reincarnates as a prostitute in the city of Tyre. Her name is also Ellen, which of course means the moon. So you've got a goddess connotation right there. And of course, Simon is a very solar figure. The word Simon, some say, actually means the sun. So he finds her and they both unite. Night and suddenly the world is well together, or at least the world was healed, and they go around preaching to the world. In another le- another legend, she gets uh, Simon gets into battles with Peter, these magical battles, and of course loses because it was uh, Orthodox Christians writing about it. So Simon was a fascinating figure, and I know we're talking about John the Baptist, but mm-hmm. from what it seems, there's a lot of hiding, there's a lot of covering, just like a lot of the Gnostics Gospels got covered too, including the Nag Hammadi Library buried, hidden, or sometimes censored. So it seems there's there's a good case to make that the true Christianity might have started with John the Baptist. He might have been one of the originators of this mystic Christianity. And in fact, the Mandeans, one of the last remaining Gnostic sects of today that unfortunately have been persecuted so brutally in Iraq, they contend that John the Baptist is really the true font of the true religion and that Jesus is more of an usurper, a, a false figure. So there is a lot of evidence that John the Baptist is not this sort of a barbarian like you see him in the movies with the furs or how he's portrayed in the New Testament, but he might have yeah. been very much as a very wise shaman and so forth. But again, there's very little to know about this. Well, you know, speaking of Jesus, was it the Valentinians who saw him as a Gnostic savior? Well, I think most of the Gnostics did that. I mean, obviously they were Christian. He was the incarnation of the Logos. He was part of, he was, uh, again, an incarnation of the Aeon Christ, the Aeon Savior. And some of these myths, he's he is the consort of Sophia. You have re- reason and you have wisdom. 
in uh, some of the Valentinians, it gets pretty strange because Sophia actually gives birth to Yaldabaoth, the Demiurge, but she also gives birth to Jesus. So you have this sort of uh, new Cain and Abel story where these two figures are fighting each other for the universe. So, uh, yeah, most of them saw Jesus as sort of, uh, yeah, he was the principle of sal- of wholeness in the universe, of restoration and so forth. But they had varying degrees. I mean, in the Gnostic Gospels, a lot, of, especially the Sethian ones, Jesus is sort of this shape-shifting deity. He comes down to earth, passing the heavens. He tricks the archons that don't recognize him. He takes human shape, and he sort of moves around and does all these magical powers. He's he's a lot cooler. He's more of a, you might say, a superhero in those days. And he's certainly, and he's more fun than the Orthodox Jesus. I mean, like in the Gospel of Philip, he's surrounded by all these haughty women. He kisses Mary Magdalene <laughs> on the lips. He's always, he laughs. In some of the Gospel, he dances with everybody. He's just as so again, he's very much sort of a trickster deity, and he definitely has a very Promethean Hermes vibe to him. Yeah, sounds like a playboy, too, on some level, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, well, <laughs> Sophia is a woman's woman, and yeah. Jesus is a man's man on earth. I mean, they are perfection incarnate here. <laughs> there, there you go. Mary so, Magdalene is the incarnation of Sophia, according to a lot of the Gnostic Gospels. So, okay, so did did certain Gnostic sects see Jesus as a mythical figure and not necessarily a real person? I think a lot of them do say, like the Ebionites and some of them, yeah, they would say he was a historical figure. A lot of them see him more as a phantasm or a spirit or a principle. It's hard to say with a lot of them. Again, it's not like they were writing history. They were writing their own mystical fan fiction and adding different things to it based on revelations and also using a lot of mythopoeia to create a lot of symbolism and hidden numbers and all that, which affected how their Jesus character did. So they had varying uses for him. Again, in one gospel, he's sort of a shape shifter. In another one, he's sort of a phantasm that comes in and out of the world without ever being physical. He just appears or appears inside people. So they had uh, varying views of who they saw Jesus. Yeah, And yes, some did see him as sort of a physical character. Speaking of shape shifting, remind me to tell you my chupacabra story later. Oh, I'd love to hear that. I love <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, chupacabra is awesome. Absolutely, yeah. So another <laughs> figure that I've that I really enjoy hearing about is Paul of Tarsus, uh, Paul the Apostle, or Saul of Tarsus, as he was originally known. Now, this is this is an interesting character to me because of reasons maybe unrelated to Gnosticism, and I have a question on that in a moment. But first, how did the Gnostics view Paul? Ah, they loved him. They loved him to death. They loved him to death. So they drew inspiration. I mean, words like archons and Sophia and uh, Gnosis and uh, even Pleroma. These were taken from the letters of Paul. Paul definitely shows a lot of Gnostic sensibility. And I know that's hard for a lot of listeners to understand, but there was an article. I mean, I've kind of gone back and forth. There was a time when I read like uh, Timothy Freak and Peter Gandhi's book, The Jesus Mysteries, Mysteries, and I was like, oh, Paul was a full-blown Gnostic. And then I sort of went away from it. And then now these days I've sort of gone back. Because here's the issue, Ryan. When we read the letters of Paul, we tend to read into it the theology that we were already thought or our cultural conditioning. We read into it hell. We read into original sin. We read into it the pastorals that weren't written by him and so forth. So we suddenly, we project into Paul what a formative Christian theology would be. But in an article that came out recently in Aeon magazine called Everything You Know About the Gospel of Paul is Likely Wrong, I think it was written by David Bentley Hart. He's an Eastern Orthodox scholar and philosopher, but he said, if you take all of that out, if you stop reading into Paul all this stuff, there is one message that Paul is saying. His primal message is this. We are controlled by archons and the mission of Jesus is to come and wake us up and break us out of this world. And I was like, whoa, that is amazingly a Gnostic view. I mean, if you really read Paul, that's what you're going to say. I mean, Jesus is sort of, uh, yeah, he is the overthrow of the archons, the powers and principalities, the rulers of this age, as Paul keeps saying. And his grace and his, uh, his it, the information he brings will release us from the bondage of this world. So when you put Paul in, those, in that new light, you really do understand why the Gnostics suddenly were so inspired and gaga about them. Obviously, they added a lot more to it. But in essence, that's Paul. Yeah, so I came across a list of alchemists a couple of years ago, and Paul's name was on there. 
And I found that to be curious, obviously. So Mm -hmm. I did some research on this and his inclusion on that list. And I forget, I didn't even try to search for it again. I I should probably try to dig it up. But his inclusion on that list may be connected to the story of his shipwreck, which seems to either have been on or near Malta. And Hmm. Malta is an interesting place, pretty mysterious place. The, The Malta megaliths and caves are a literal rabbit hole that's worth going down. And they bring in stories of giants and passages to the inner earth. And then, you know, there's the, the Knights of Malta, the Catholic military order that has some direct connections to alchemy when you dig into their story. And this is a long way of, of me asking you if, if you know anything about Paul's shipwreck and what he may have actually encountered or been exposed to. Because from some of these tangential stories, it seems like he could have encountered some different types of people and ideas. Hmm. No, I haven't heard anything. Honestly, that is very interesting. But uh, again, there, the, when you really start studying ancient Christianity, you realize there is a lot of, I don't want to say fan fiction, but there's a lot of folklore and legends around all these characters, more than you could really shake a stick at. I mean, there are stories of Jesus in front of Mary Magdalene, in this, for what it's called, the Question of Mary, where Jesus brings her up to a mountain and he pulls out an E from his own ribs and he has sex with her in front of Mary and Mary cries but this is all sort of a hidden ritual that some of these uh, sex magic Gnostics were doing but my point is there's a lot of legends I mean, even stories of Mary Magdalene and Jesus having romantic encounters, that was happening in the 4th, 5th century. I mean, that stuff was out there. People people were writing about these things just like they write today. Yeah, they definitely were. And the reason I find that, that Paul story about alchemy and his shipwreck in Malta so provocative is because when we think about, and I've heard you and some of your guests talk about this, we think about the character of Simon Magus, who you mentioned earlier. You've talked before about how that may be a cipher for Paul. So if Simon Magus was this power powerful magician and Paul has this alchemical leaning in some of these more hidden stories, that might make a lot of sense that this is the same character, right? Yes, you have got this sort of uh, prototype of this magician appearing in stories. And like you said, some of the enemies who weren't happy with Paul said, yes, Paul was a cipher for Simon Magus and so forth. And there's certainly evidence out there. So yeah, I think you might be onto something, Ryan. Is there some hard evidence or is, is it just high speculation? I think it's pretty hard at this point. I mean, again, this is what some of the enemies of Paul thought so. There are Jewish scriptures would come that, uh, I forget the name of it, but there are Jews, uh, Jewish works, I wouldn't say they're scriptures, but works that come out and say that Paul used to call himself Simon, that, w- that was one of his names. And then there's so many interesting parallels, you start wondering about these things. I mean, uh, you've got the church father Irenaeus, who in, his, in a lot of his polemics goes something like, well, and so he talks about Simon Magus and gnosis and all that but then he slips in oh but he also believed in uh in salvation by grace and suddenly he suddenly throws out a, a pauline idea on simon magus and um, there's so many parallels i mean even in the acts of the apostles and the story where simon is doing these great magical tricks and then suddenly he wants to buy the holy spirit and peter rebukes him that has a lot of parallels to what paul did when he went down to jerusalem and he had brought all this money because he wanted to there was a famine and he wanted to help and he got it and he started butting heads with Peter. So when you start seeing all this, I wouldn't call it definite evidence, but it starts making a lot of sense. Yeah, it sounds like it, man. So one person I do want to talk about who's not in the Gospels, but he's one writer I've always admired, and that's William Blake. And I was actually introduced to Blake not through his own writings, but through a film called Dead Man starring Johnny Depp and Mm -hmm. directed by Jim Jarmusch, who I mentioned earlier. I've seen Blake labeled as both Gnostic and not a Gnostic, but it's hard to not acknowledge a Gnostic way of thinking in his writing. What do you think of Blake and his worldview and mythology? Is he a Gnostic or was he just exhibiting some Gnostic tendencies from time to time? I would say he's very Gnostic. I mean, obviously people can argue. People argue about that with Jung too. I mean, how influenced was he? I mean, there's a lot of uh, discussion in academia because that's what you do. You argue back and forth. But even with us as children most of us were exposed to tiger tiger if that's not a poem about the demiurge you know how fearful is thy symmetry and all that then i don't know what is but uh when you start looking at his works it really seems to come right out of the uh, some of the gnostic groups of ancient times i mean you look at the four goas and you look at the book of urizen and what do you see you see almost a, a gnostic myth coming out you see this one true god who suddenly falls apart into these different aspects and they're both 
both syzygies, like the Gnostic aeons, male and female. And uh, one of the main ones is urizen, which he called, ure- which really meant urizen, because Blake was very much against the Enlightenment vibe of pure rationalism. He was against the whole Newt- Newtonian physics world and the Lockean empirical view. So the demiurge to him was urizen, and uh, this was a tyrannical god who uh, created this, as he called, that reality was a world of obstacles, basically kept us trapped into forgetfulness and bad dreams. I mean, if that's not out of the Gnostics, I mean, the whole thing with the Gnostic Gospels is that as humans, we are kept trapped in this prison with for- forgetfulness and ignorance. So in a lot of his other ideas of the Demiurge, he called it ratio, which was this sort of a personification of cold, hard, logical, oppressive thinking. And um, another character that was very much like the Demiurge was Nobo Daddy. And then you look at other of his poems, including, again, the Book of Urizen or the, the Four Goas or even his poem on. Uh, on Milton, you see that one thing that Blake is writing about is the loss of the devon of the divine feminine in the world. That somehow the true God has lost that, and the world is a much worse place. And then, as a whole, Blake is very Gnostic. I mean, Blake really believed that we were all oppressed in this world. We were oppressed by our cultural systems, by our politics, by everything else. But what oppressed us the most was our own thoughts, our own egoic thoughts and rational thoughts. I mean, what did you? He, he write about he call it the mind forge manacles so we were sort of trapped within our own heads as just as we were trapped into the universe and the way to get out to him the gnosis was our artistic expression that's how we broke out of the mind forge manacles and saw the universe for what it was and liberated what was beautiful and holy from the universe so in a i mean i can't think of anything more gnostic than that <laughs> yeah i mean i believe he also said that the imagination was god or or something mm-hmm. similar to that so that that speaks to what you're talking about. So it's hard to yeah, not I see mean, him uh, as an, like I said, when in the Gnostic myths, when the one mind consciousness explodes, it's uh, this sort of flowing out of imagination, of possibility, of its different aspects and all that. And I think Blake definitely saw that. If you really read the Gnostic Gospels, and even Jung said. The mind of God is really our mind. Each one of us has the mind of the true God as humans. And if we can sort of individuate ourselves and restore a mind where it works well and calibrate it to the pleroma, then we can become, I don't know about God-like, but we can uh, commune with this power. And that's definitely right out of Blake. But to Blake, it was the artistic expression that truly made us holy. Blake's definition, too, of the human psyche is later popularized by the work of Jung. You know, it was a fourfold mm-hmm. system which corresponds to reason, intuition, feeling, and sensation. You know, Jung wrote about that, but Blake was writing about that way before that, too. So, again, mm-hmm. very Gnostic. And but Yes, you know, I that, would say very Gnostic. Yeah. yeah, and my first introduction to Blake's writings, like, after I, I watched Dead Man, was I read The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, and I didn't really get it at the time, but now I, I see that as that's a pretty alchemical poem to me. I do get caught up in this whole unification of the opposites, maybe a bit too much, but you know, <laughs> I, I guess alchemy was my entry point into the occult in general, so I guess it makes sense to, to read it that way. But do you see it that way too? Is the marriage of heaven and hell just a, another you know, veiled reference to uniting masculine and feminine? Yeah, I would say so, too. I mean, Blake is very complex. You can certainly see some Neoplatonism in him, uh, even a little bit of Kabbalah. I mean, he's, uh, again, a very complex, cutting-edge kind of guy. But, yeah, I would certainly see alchemy. It's hard, yeah, when you're talking about alchemy and so forth, it's, it's, it's going to overlap with Gnosticism. It's going to overlap with Hermeticism. But Blake definitely, it's interesting because he's considered an Enlightenment poet, but he was the one who was so against how humanity was going to. It seems like the beauty and the breakthroughs of the renaissance time of bruno and all those guys was immediately getting cast down and all of the sudden the universe was turning into again an empirical cold logical place and all the joy and all the divinity was going to be slowly uh, squeezed out of it and in a lot of ways his uh, his warnings were right and of course blake was just as polemical against the church itself i mean he does write a lot of less than kind things about uh, the 
church and about normative Christianity around there. I mean, we do know he was into Swedenborg. I don't know that much about mm-hmm. Swedenborg, but we also know that he was a natural born mystic. I mean, he was uh, the kind of guy that at five had visions of angels. I mean, he was all, it seemed like his sight was always in the spiritual world as it was always in the, the world here. And he's complex. I mean, in one letter, he did say, nature is the work of the devil. But at the same time, he was always talking about how divinity could be found in nature, that there, there were you could see infinity in a, in a sunflower and so forth. And if you cleanse the door of perception, you'll see everything as it is, which is infinite. So like the ancient Gnostics, the Gnostics weren't very keen on nature of the world, but they also realized that the divine spark, the divinity was trapped in every single thing in the world and every rock and every animal and any person. And as humans, we could be co uh I don't know. We could be we could work together with Sophia, with divine wisdom and with uh, Jesus, divine reason, and get this divinity out of the world and bring it out uh, so that it could shine stronger here in the black iron prison of the Demiurge. (laughs) Definitely. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, one of the, the things I love about your show is you love to talk about Gnosticism in fiction and film. I mean, you book guests that are novelists and and filmmakers that are doing contemporary stories with these themes in them. And I just love that because I think it's an aspect of this, you know, alternative podcast community that gets overlooked sometimes is, is the component of it in fictional storytelling. So I like that you take that route, and we're going to wind this conversation down with a bit of a game. If you heard my episode with Gordon White, you know what I'm referring to here. Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun. (laughs) The hat game is back, so (laughs) I've I've given this a name for this conversation. The game is called How Gnostic Are They? And I wrote down uh, about 30 or 35 names of films and a few novels. I put them in the hat, and I'm going to draw one out and tell me... We'll draw like a few out here, but tell me... You know, how Gnostic they are, and we're going to use a three-level scale, all right? So all right. level one okay. is needs a bit more Gnosis. <laughs> level two is so Gnostic. And level three is Gnostic as fuck. So all right. those are our three levels that we're going to grade these on, or that you're going to grade these on. So I did not include the Matrix, because we get it. It's Gnostic as fuck. Uh, <laughs> I did not include Philip K. Dick's work for the same reason. Uh, and yeah, it's you, like Donna <laughs> Brazil feeding the the answers right. to at a CNN to, to Hillary. It's too easy, Absolutely. right? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So if you haven't seen or read something that I draw out, that's fine. Just say so. Just say pass, and we'll we'll draw another. So the hat's here. I got it ready to go. And the first one that I'm gonna draw out here is they live. Seen it? Oh my God! Yes, good one. Was that on purpose, Ryan? Because you went uh, gnos- gnostic as f right off the bat. <laughs> I mean that uh, John Carpenter's mar- masterpiece is right there. I mean you've got the archons, the ancient aliens who are oppressing us, who are keeping us ignorant and asleep, and are basically well, they're basically eating us. It seems so. That right there is uh, gnostic as f. Well, it wasn't intentional, but I'm glad I'm glad I drew it out because I'm a fan of Roddy Piper being a pro wrestling fan. Oh, I thought he, he was, was just awesome. I God. thought he was fantastic <laughs> in that movie. Might be the best crossover from a pro wrestler into film that I've seen. Right. Oh, I would agree. I mean, that movie is so good. I mean, even that 10 minute fight they have. I mean, that right there is yeah. the book of Jonah. How stubborn we humans are. None of us want to wear the glasses or take the red pill. We all want to live in our safe little worlds, and it's hard when you put on the glasses and you say, oh my God, we are ruled by some very bad agents from our government to beyond. Everything we've been taught is a lie. I mean, it's hard, but that movie uh, put it well, put everything so well together. It's a masterpiece. Yeah, and I, I've seen that fight land at the top of several like best fight scenes in film history. It's it, it's, <laughs> it's always great. like in the top three, it seems. But <laughs> put on know, the glasses. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I I may argue with you about it being Carpenter's masterpiece because I'm a huge Halloween fan from back in the day. Oh but, God, of course. Yeah, sure, with sure. Carpenter, it's so hard. He's got. I mean, he's got so the many great too. films. But, yeah, yeah. So let's draw out another one here. Equilibrium. Have you seen that film with Christian Bale? Oh my God, that's it's been a long time. It's probably about about eight, eight years. What's your middle one? It's what uh, Gnostic is F needs a little more gnosis. Uh, What's this two th- is uh, so Gnostic. 
I would say that one is so Gnostic, but it's been a long time and it didn't really, again, it didn't stick to me like the first time I watched They Live, where I was like, oh, this is it. But I remember it had some good vibes and had the whole false reality going and everything else. And Christian Bale is a, just an excellent actor no matter what he does. Sure, sure, definitely. Yeah, I am a big Christian Bale fan. I like those Batman, that Dark Knight trilogy. I'm not sure if the Dark Knight's rather Gnostic. Would you call that Gnostic, by the way? I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, I uh, so. no, I would say no. Definitely need some more gnosis. I mean, yeah, you could say uh, <laughs> the Joker is sort of, uh, again, this trickster deity who, I mean, Jesus does say in the Gospel of Thomas, I have cast fire on the world and now I want to watch it burn. And you could relate that to the, what the Joker was doing, the eternal anarchist. But other than that, I don't see much, much there that uh, you could tie it into Gnosticism. Fair enough, fair enough. That wasn't in here. That's just something I wanted to know based on the Christian Bale reference. The novels of Philip Pullman. Have you read any of them? Yes, yes. And I would say, I would say, what was, God, I keep forgetting the middle one. What's the middle so, one? It's just so I don't Gnostic. want to take the middle path. For some <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just so Gnostic. A dualist. Yeah, it's so Gnostic. I mean, it's no secret that Philip Pullman... He does a lot of research. He knows his history. So he did study Gnosticism. That's no secret. And the idea of dust and all that and the powers behind it, right out of Gnosticism and the Demiurge. So, yes, it's right there. Yeah, Philip is actually, he's on my list of people to contact here soon because, one, I don't know how many novels he has left in him. Just put out a new one or is putting out a new one. I, I don't remember. But, yeah, that, um, God, what's, what's the trilogy that had the uh, Golden Compass in it? I can't remember the name of it now. But yeah, that, her, her, oh my God, her materials. His, yeah, his I'm, I'm drawing a blank too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was his dark materials. That's it, that's it. The yes, thought. Yeah, yes, that's it. Definitely that's influenced a, by Gnosticism. Absolutely, yeah, for sure. So I'm going to draw out maybe just two more here. So let's let's go with this one. Twelve Monkeys. Did you see that film? Ooh. Twelve Monkeys. Yeah, I would put that in the so Gnostic category because, again, we have the idea of the false realities. We have the idea in the Gnostic Gospels, whether it's Neo or Morpheus or Jesus, you're not getting saved by your sins. You're getting saved by the information you give the world and how you can disrupt the powers of fate. And texts like the Pista Sophia, Jesus actually tilts the zodiac to mess around with the archons basically he wants to tilt everything so he can break the powers of fate and liberate humanity so you definitely see that vibe in uh, 12 monkeys so yes uh, so gnostic yeah there's another terry gilliam film in here that i hope i draw here it's gonna be the last one i draw but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna search for it i'm just gonna draw randomly <laughs> but if i but if i don't draw brazil i'm gonna ask you about it anyways probably yeah well that, obviously <laughs> i was just thinking of that film yes yeah. brazil very gnostic <laughs> yeah that's that's gnostic af for sure yes yes gnostic uh, is f god what a brilliant <laughs> film underrated brilliant film oh i don't think it's under well i mean it, it got the criterion treatment a few years ago and i i um, bought it and that's you know i don't know if you've seen any of the uh, criterion films but they just do a great job with like the restoration of the prince and giving you all these bonus features it's like a 50 dollar dvd set but it's well worth the money if you're a fan of the film for sure uh, so wow last... i'll have to check it out i mean i've yeah. watched brazil like at least 20 times in my life so well, we're yeah, all it's... in this together kid it's a great <laughs> film absolutely so the last one i drew out here the wizard of oz which is one of my ah, favorite movies. The movie. Wizard of Oz, of course. Well, that would I'd say is uh, so Gnostic. I would put it in the middle of the pack because that almost sounds maybe Platonic or Neoplatonic. I mean, because you could even say make the same argument for Alice in Wonderland, where the Gnostics got these ideas of the divine feminine was really Plato. And in Plato's work, he always talks about the fallen soul and talks about the fallen soul being um, feminine. So again, as we talked, I mentioned earlier about Sophia and being taken out of the Old Testament and Greek mythology and so forth. But we also have to think of Plato. They saw the soul as a feminine fallen into this world, and she represented each one of us. What did Joseph Campbell called it? The, the soul highs adventure. It starts out in the world of ideas and the perfection and the pleroma, whatever you want to call it. And then the soul falls into matter, into this strange place. The Gnostics took a, sort of a more negative thing. They would, in their writings, they would talk about how the Gnostic is trapped by bandits, just like in Simon Magus, in his myth, Enoya is trapped and put in a brothel and so forth. They had a, her being trapped 
left in the world was not a good thing. It was also bad because, after all, just like us, the divine soul of the world, the world soul, Sophia, needs to fall into forgetfulness and ignorance, and uh, trauma is one way to do it. Uh, the Archons are very known to uh, rape people till they basically forget their identity, their true home. So uh, you definitely see so you, this female character falling into the alien world. Well, yes, that is very Gnostic, but it's also Neoplatonic, too. So in Alice in Wonderland and The Wizard of Oz, you have the main characters who you could say represent the divine soul, the world soul, the ultimate soul, who falls into this world and has to do a lot of trials to somehow get back to the divine world or her home, whatever you want to call it. So very symbolical movies, but we do know that the writer Frank Baum was a theosophist, so he certainly had a lot of occult lore. He probably was familiar, like any theosophist, with the Gnostic uh, myths, just as he was with others. But at the end of the day, it was Dorothy falling down into the world. Was it really negative? Was Oz really negative? I guess he could make an argument for it, because the Wizard of Oz, in a way, he is the demiurge, right? He's mm -hmm. the man behind the curtain who's pulling all the levers but at the end of the day he's a false god he's not the true god he's deficient he has his own agenda and he's very limited but at the same time he's not really a bad fellow and that's the other thing i probably should have mentioned is that in neoplatonism and in the, st in the stories of plato and the timaeus the demiurge is actually a benign character the gnostics has always had to turn things inside out and make it as radical as possible so they made the demiurge a very holy figure in ancient times they made him into to, uh, sort of a demonic tyrant, if you would. So, yeah, I know that was a long answer, but yes, I would say so Gnostic, Wizard of Oz. I don't know, man. The way you describe that might be Gnostic as fuck. It sounds pretty Gnostic. <laughs> I have a lot <laughs> yeah. of friends who would say would agree with you, Ryan. Yeah. But uh, again, I don't. I guess uh, with me, it has to be really edgy and really dark and really existentialist to mm -hmm. be fully Gnostic because I really do see the Gnostics as very uh, again existentialist. Okay, well, hey, fair enough, fair enough. That's why I play these games with people. So I'm going to get you out of here on the last question, and I just want to know, is there a Gnostic view of love? Well, yes, of course. I mean, you have, uh, again, the great story, the great love story of Sophia and Christ, and that is a story. You've got the great story of uh, Barbalo and the ultimate source, the invisible spirit. In the Valentinian stories, you have the the great mother and father you've got silence and depth so it does start with this great story this interplay of two figures trying to understand each other and how their children come out of them and how they go on these adventures how it gets manifested down upon earth upon the material worlds you do see so in a way these are these are great loves again simon magus and ellen these two figures that are searching for each other through lifetimes through regenerations and they find each other and what happens they become whole. So uh, you might say, I don't know about romantic, but there is evidence that uh, St. Valentine is probably more appropriate to have been based on Valentinus because in Christianity, Christianity started out as very dry, very ascetic. Marriage was seen as something negative. Valentinus in the second century sort of restored it and said, no, uh, women and men must uh, be together. They must love each other in marriage in this ritual that they call the bridal chamber, this sort of sexual love union, which sort of, again, encompassed Christ and Sophia. So you do see this sort of powerful love motif. And again, I'm going back to Plato, but like a lot of occult systems, this comes from the myth of Plato with the hermaphrodite. You had this powerful entity that was both man and woman. He was a, a mixture of Hermes and Aphrodite. And there comes Zeus, the demiurge figure of the Greeks, and he's so jealous that he splits them apart. And these two figures, like Simon and Ellen, are searching for each other across time, across dimensions. So when they may get together, they become you. They become uh, one. They become supremely powerful. And of course, you into alchemy. I'm sure you know all about the alchemical unions and all that. So yes, love is very important in Gnosticism. And of course, altruism and being kind to your neighbor, loving your neighbor and all that. You do find it. And underneath all this uh, great dark epic of Sophia and Yaldabaoth and the world being an illusion and the raping archons and the violence of the floods, you do find a, a lot of love there. It's fantastic, man. Yeah. I, I just love hearing 
different takes on love. So I appreciate you <laughs> dropping that one here for us. That's- I always like Doctor Who who said, love is a promise. And I always like that <laughs> definition of love. I mean, love is the, love is the gnosis, the information we're going to give each other to liberate one another. Oh, definitely, man. That's a great way to look at it for sure. So Miguel, thanks for being here, man. Please do tell people where they can keep up with you and your work. Yes, for more of these Gnostic shenanigans, uh, go simply to thegodabovegod.com, and you'll find, uh, obviously, you'll find the podcast, my books, articles, uh, videos, and all that stuff. If you have any questions or anything, just go to the contact page and uh, send me a note, and I'd be glad to interact with you. Yeah, and we should also point out real quick, you have the best opening, like, 10 to 15 minutes of any podcast out there, so... I, <laughs> thanks, I, there are, well, it always gets varied reactions with people. Some people, they are cursing me and telling me to die because I dare do these long introductions because they want to get to the interview and all that, but I don't know why, because when I listen to a podcast, let's say I'm listening to Joe Rogan, I'm like, I'm just going to move the cursor until I can hear the guest voice. I mean, it's right. simple as that. I don't, yeah. I don't have to listen listen to Joe Rogan's commercials. That's, but uh, people sometimes like to complain and they like to suffer because here we are in the in the desert of the real and trapped in the black iron prison with our complaints. Well, I like it because you've turned podcasting into an art form and that's why I admire it. So keep doing it. But, uh... <laughs> well, thank you so much. <laughs> I shall. We're all doing a great job here, all those in the alternative media. So please, listeners, support your independent podcaster, Ryan, myself. It doesn't matter who, because uh, when it comes to the establishment, uh, they're all ruled by the archons. We are sort of these uh, voices in the wilderness who's trying to wake you up to who you really are, who you deserve to be. Definitely, man. Definitely. Well, I appreciate your time. And again, admire your work. Been a fan of it for a few years now. So keep doing what you do, man. And I hope to talk to you again soon. No, I really enjoyed it. And yeah, you keep doing what you're doing it and uh, enjoyed it too. Thank you. And there you have it. My thanks again to Miguel Connor. Thegodabovegod.com is the place to be if you're seeking some of that sweet, sweet gnosis. You know, Miguel touched on something at the beginning of the chat that I've been tossing around in my mind for a couple months now. And this comes on the heels of chats with Dr. Dean Radin and Evo Dominguez about psychism. And there's some stuff sort of lurking in the shadows of their ideas, specifically Dr. Radin's. Miguel said there are no secrets anymore, that this stuff is out in the open because of the internet. But that takes the magic out of it. And hey, listen, I'm not a magical practitioner, I've said that many times, but I do find the occult intellectually simulating and maybe it fills some emotional void in me too. But looking at all this stuff as an outsider, I'd have to agree, moving this into the open does sort of take the shine off of it. It's kind of like when you're told not to do something, it's enjoyable as fuck to do it, and it makes you want to do it even more. Drinking alcohol at 19 is way more fun than drinking at 22 because you might get caught. The risk is fun, it's sexy, it motivates you on a subconscious level. But when nothing is off limits and everything is out in the open, well, not as sexy. And in this case, not as magical. I understand we all want validation for what we believe to be true, but if science can validate something like magic, doesn't that make it sort of unmagical? And why are we pushing for the validation anyway, especially from guys who are as connected as Dr. Dean Radin? I see conspiracy theorists question organizational ties all the time, and Radin has a lot of ties to organizations that folks would typically question, groups long involved in cultural conditioning and social engineering. Yet because he's working toward a validation on some level of magic, or Psy, we don't question what may be the motivation behind that, and I think we should. Anyway, I gotta thank a few people here, Philip, Jordan, and Kelly for recently supporting the Patreon campaign. Kelly actually became an official executive producer of the show, jumping in as an air patron at 10 bucks a month, and you can join these fine folks if you like what you're hearing for as little as 2 bucks a month over at patreon.com slash culture. Like Miguel said, support what you enjoy, support what you like, support what you love. And if you enjoy this, if you like this, if you love this, patreon.com slash culture The best way to show that love. You can also leave a nice five-star review on iTunes. We'd like to see some more of those if you dig what you're hearing. Dollars, downloads, drop-in reviews. All matters, all appreciated, and all out of time this time. So until next time, you've just been initiated into culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question Authority.
Oh,